Welcome to Crazy Shit in Real Estate, a weekly podcast where I walk you through some of the wildest, most unbelievable stories you'll hear from the world of real estate. If you like real estate and you love crazy, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to Crazy Shit in Real Estate, where we do our best to um, make people say, what did he just say? That's our, kind of our goal in life. and But not in the in the Alex Jones style of wild conspiracies, just in the real life stories. <laughs> yes, yes, we'll stick to the facts, we'll stick to the truth. I still was kind of surprised that Spotify yanked that episode with Joe Rogan. I'm like, the, if you let people listen to it, they get to decide. If you hide it, they go looking for it. Come on, man. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it was probably just a poor choice of guests to begin with. But once you do it, then you're like censoring it. If you, you know, it's like, right. I mean, he's interesting uh, to listen to. And I think all of us know he's wildly out there. But I like wildly out there people because I either go to my research and get more grounded or I ask questions. And we should all be asking questions. Yep. I agree. You got to be curious. You got to find your own facts. And, uh, you know, you should you should listen to the different voices out there and make your own decision. Exactly. So, Dave, tell us where you're located. I'm up in Maine. Uh, we're getting our first or technically second snow of the year today. So and friends, by the way, we're recording this end of October. So that's, you know, for North Carolina, that would never happen. But for Maine, that's still pretty early, right? Aren't you a few weeks ahead of normal snow? There's usually uh, a dusting or something in October, November, you know, but it, that's, those are just the warning shots. It's really, you know, December, January, February, March. Those are the snowy months. And you need that, right? We can't kill off mosquitoes if we don't get a nice, good, cold, deep snap. The ticks, the mosquitoes, you know, uh, we, we Mainers love our winter sports. So, you know, it's, it's no problem. You're lucky to live up there. It's so pretty. So did you grow up there? How did you land in Maine? I did. Yeah, I grew up in Maine. I, I live about a half mile from the house I grew up in. So oh. I'm kind of a bumpkin, uh, you know, not not falling far from the tree. But well, I've traveled in life. <laughs> if people have never been to Maine, which most people haven't, and you should, you got some beautiful national park land up there. And it's just stunning countryside. But I don't know if they think about how rural most of it is because people think about Portland or you think about the coast. But so much of Maine, you're just driving around like, this is just bucolic. It's just a yeah. great way to use that good vocabulary word. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's, it, our motto is the way life should be. And I, I believe it. You know, that's why I've stayed because I've seen the rest of the world. And, you know, I've really loved uh, the quiet, peaceful countryside and, you know, up here. So it's a great place to be. But I like North Carolina. I like all kinds of different places, too. And that's the fun of real estate is you get to visit all kinds of different places. It really is. And so what have you ever done in and around the real estate space in your life? Yeah. Besides uh, buying and selling houses yourself, because we should all have the goal of home ownership one day. Yep. I'm, I'm sitting in my home, uh, first and only home so far uh, right now. And, uh, you know, I've been a renter when I was an entrepreneur and I had retail stores in South America and Bolivia. I rented different, uh, you know, retail spaces. So I had that experience of forking over an uncomfortable amount of money and kind of burning it up in return for the right to occupy a space. And it kind of occurred to me, like, wouldn't it be better to own this, though? And then I forked that same money over to the bank for what is mine. <laughs> so that kind of planted a seed. I became a passive investor in 2011 after my MBA program. A good friend of mine from Carleton College became an architect, started working with developers and sent me this friends and family offering. They were building a 100 unit building in Minneapolis. and I was I was crazy enough to hop on for the ride. Uh, you know, I had only done stock investing at that point, so I thought a fifteen or twenty percent annual return was crazy. And you know, come to find out in real estate, I mean, that's pretty pedestrian. You know, it you can, can happen if you if you buy right. I mean, the thing about real estate is very similar to the stock market. You have to buy correctly. It's not about selling. It's about being smart on the purchase and buying anything in twenty eleven. Pretty sure everybody in 2020 looks back and says, I wish I'd have done something back then, too, because it was a scary market and it's hard to take advantage of a scary market. But when you take those risks, it really does have an opportunity to pay off. Not that it always does, but the chances are pretty good. Oh, exactly. And the longer you hold, the more likely you are to do well. You know, I don't like trying to time the market. 
you know, because way back in 2016, 17, when I first started getting really active, you know, I was already thinking, man, that we're due for a recession. We're due for something, you know, maybe prices are too high. I should just hold off. Well, thank God I didn't because a lot of those properties I bought in 2017 are up 50%. Um, it's wild, you know, isn't it? It, it is. Uh, if you're in it for the long run, I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, there's the very common expression, you make your money when you buy. I, I thought of another one the other day, though, and I want to try it out on people, is that you also make your money when you manage. Because I have found in my own career that the management of your building uh, is, is just as, if not more important than the price that you bought it for, you know, because of your monthly expenses. Yeah, that mortgage, you know, principal interest payment that represents your purchase price, that's a chunk. But the lower interest rates go, the less critical that chunk actually is compared to your taxes, your utilities. You know, I'm doing my first tax abatement uh, visit with a, a town official soon. You know, that's exciting stuff because you can cut your biggest expense, you know, way down dramatically uh, through things that people don't always think about. And note to listeners on the show who are not realtor professionals, you need to talk to your local municipality about tax abatement because it's wildly different in different states, counties, and municipalities. And so you want a tax professional to help you with things like that. Because when we talk about great management, Dave doesn't mean you have to do everything yourself because a lot of times great management involves being surrounded by amazing professionals who can help you with those decisions. So just flash flirt alert, always call a pro for things like that. That's giant and big. So anyway, I totally uh, train wrecked that for a second because that's kind of critical when we talk about tax oh, things no, to make sure people call a pro. So what are you investing in right now? Do you buy in Maine? Are you buying elsewhere? Do you buy in South America? Can you buy in Bolivia right now? Do you even know? Because I know the Argentinian uh, market has yeah. recently changed and there's finally mortgages available in Argentina again. Right. Uh, my wife is, is Bolivian. We met down there. Uh, so I have the advantage of having family there. So they own property that I've participated in buying. So I could say I own it, but legally I don't. And so, your wife might get mad if you take all the credit. <laughs> just saying. She's the boss. You know, that's that's how I, I run my life. And I would recommend it to the listeners. So, yes, you can own all over the world. You know, we own a little plot of land in Bolivia, but all of my real estate investing recently has been up in Maine because I just love having this tactile feeling of like, I can drive by properties and see the improvement in the neighborhood right there. Like that, and, and you know, my neighbors come and thank me for that paint job that we did, you know, to the house that was the eyesore on the block. And I can't get that when my money flies a thousand miles away. I'm not saying you shouldn't invest outside your home market or that's a bad thing at all. It's just, it's a personal preference. There's no wrong, wrong way to eat a Reese's here. And I think for me, the local, you know, hometown feeling is, is really special. Uh, so that's why it's stayed in Maine. Well, and there's something to be said too for, as you said, the neighbors will thank you, but what they see is a tangible, visible investment where you live. And I think a lot of people out there, before you get involved in rental properties and investment, you probably think it's something that has to be really nice, really fancy, or you have this image in your head of slumlords and really junky stuff. But there's a lot of investors out there that buy less expensive properties so that they can take care of the property and provide an affordable place for people to live. So if you're worried about affordability situation in your market or where workforce housing opportunities lie, uh, you could be a part of that solution. It doesn't have to be big government. It can be investors who say, I have a heart for where I live and I want it to be better. So with that being said, so you've done a lot of things in a lot of different places. I'd love to know what's the craziest scenario situation, something you ran into where you were like, I just cannot believe I am seeing this, doing this, experiencing this. Because what I have discovered in looking at all these stories is there's always another end to that tunnel. So you always come out the other side one way or the other, but boy, how did we land in some sticky situations? Oh, there, there's so many. Uh, we could we could take a hundred years and probably not get through them all. But one that comes to mind recently is uh, we have a senior citizen uh, renter in one of our apartment buildings, and, and this is a neat building because it's on the water, on the ocean in Maine, and it's grandfathered in. So you can't just go and build an eight-unit apartment building, you know, in this area anymore. Uh, but we bought it, grandfathered in, we fixed up a bunch of the units. But he was already living there, and he'd been there a long time. His rent was kind of low, and I'm a softy. I didn't, I, I, I raised his rent by like, you know, 40 bucks a year. And we've just capped it at that ever since and got him on auto pay. And 
he didn't want to move. And we were thinking, man, he's getting kind of frail. He's alone. He has no family. I mean, he is a quintessential loner. This isn't a very safe place for him in the winters and so forth. He started using a walker. He's, he's, he's frail. So the other uh, day, uh, one of the neighbors called and said, uh, this individual had a fall the other day uh, and I haven't seen his lights on, you know, or anything. Uh, in a couple of days. And we were like, Oh my Lord, you know, we called the sheriff right away, you know, to do a wellness check. I zoomed over there thinking, and we knew this was going to happen. I mean, this was crystal clear. I'd offered to pay for him to move. I tried to help him apply for like, you know, and he has no interest. You know, his plan is to die in our unit. I mean, that's, that's your tenant's plan sometimes. And then there's not that much to do about it. hard to ever come. Yeah. You know, and he just likes being out, you know, in the woods and, and if he's paying his rent. He's a good tenant. So what, what am I going to, why do I want to kick him out? You know? So we go over there um, and I get there uh, and I just went to check to make sure the sheriff found it. Cause I'm thinking like, I don't know if they've responded or not. And it just, this is, this could be, you know, minutes mattering or something. So I'm picturing the poor man on the floor or something like that. And I, I pull in and the sheriff's just about to pull out and we kind of roll down, you know, do the, the window to window talk. I feel like I'm a cop too. And uh, you know, I, I explain, introduce myself. I'm, I'm one of the owners of the building, you know, what, What's going on? How's <laughs> he's like? He's not in there. He's not in there. And it's like, oh, okay. He's like, I thought I was going to find him there because of the way he lives. I've seen this before, and I thought I was going to find him on the floor, but he's not there. So he's probably in the hospital. We'll make some calls and, and check it out. And sure enough, they they found him in the hospital. And um, you know, I called him thinking, well, we ought to go visit him or at least check in on him, see what's going on. I mean, maybe this can be the catalyst to help him move to assisted living or something safer for him. And no way, he's he's all piss and vinegar. He's he's the same old self. He's coming right back. He just had a little fall and no big deal. And you know, it's like okay, same same old, same old. We'll we'll go back to it. So I'll have another story for you about him shortly. I'm sure we'll see. See, all I can picture when you describe the guy who doesn't want to move. Did you ever watch Ozarks on Netflix with um, oh, no, Jason Bateman? I think I watched like one episode. Yeah, he's a great actor. So there was the the old naked man who lived in the property who kept walking outside completely stark naked. And that's when I had to quit watching it because first of all, it's too suspenseful for me. But I don't like to see naked old people. But that's all I can think of when you describe your old guy who's like, I'm not going anywhere. This is where I am. I'm good. See, now you're going to have to go back and watch like episode two or something and see it again. I didn't mean to put that image in your head, Lee. I'll, I'll, I'll stick to yeah, different stories. I can't, I can't erase that not. right now. Thanks. But, you know, it, you did uncover a really interesting piece of investment real estate that we never talk about. And that's the emotion of it. Because often when we look at investment real estate and tenant and landlord relationships, everything turns into numbers on a spreadsheet. But you just exposed how this actually works, which is, we like the old guy. We don't want to upset the old guy's life. We're worried about the old guy. We are his kids and grandkids because they're not around maybe as intimately with him, his life as you are. And so you're looking at this property, not just from a cash flow perspective, but from a humanity perspective. And I love that because when when you're dead, it's going to have mattered maybe this much more that you took care of this guy than that you ran them off to make 50 more bucks a month. And I, I wish that people understood this about investors because unfortunately, when the common conversation happens about landlords and tenants, landlords all look like big, giant, evil, nasty, greedy people. They're not. Most investors are mom and pop operations. They're individuals in the community who added real estate to their portfolio for long-term cash flow and long-term tangible way to invest in the community. They're not hedge funds. They're not Wall Street. They're Main Street and not even Main Street. They're side street and alleys and driveways. So I love that you brought that up because you have other units, right? The other units are paying a market rent and it works out over time. Yeah, exactly. And and for me, uh, the reason I got into real estate was because I, I had that stereotype of the greedy landlord. And then it, it dawned on me that I could actually make a huge difference in people's lives if I not only helped my, you know, make my own home energy efficient and healthy and all those things, but could do it for tenants with their rent while I made a profit, you know, over time. Um, and I could teach other people how to do this. So to me, it's like if you're not doing a job 
that you feel is making the world a better place and helping others every day, you're going to slowly feel frustrated and empty. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll creep up on you and then it'll become the obvious thing. And I'm sure a lot of people listening are like, yeah, I've known that for a while. I want to switch or whatever. Um, and, and to me, that's my primary motivation of real estate. I mean, profit is down at number three or four, you know, like it's in there. It's, I got to have that. I'm not doing this as a charity because it's not sustainable in that way. But for me, it is about improving people's lives, uh, you know, of our contractors, of our residents, of our you know, business tenants, of everyone we work with. And why else would you do this? Maybe there's a whole story there about why so many people get into real estate during their midlife crisis that they let go of the first 20 years and say, but I want to do this. And at, at the outset, it looks like you're doing it for the money and for the flexible schedule and to run your own business. But we all know that once you're in for more than about a year, you realize it's because it's a service profession and we get to serve through real estate and and stop being quite so frustrated with the world because we can almost turn that off to an extent because we're so dialed into the smaller micro stories. And so with that being said about micro stories, I'd love to know about these books behind you. What's the scoop with Coffee yeah. Smuggler and Cyber Fire? And it's not Loser That's Fire. Crazy. See, I know y'all watch the pre-show, yeah, but right. the glare. <laughs> Coffee Smuggler's got a really good cover to it. So now I want to read it because I like it little is, sketches. It What's it about? It's a story of Gabriel de Clou, who in 1723 brought coffee to this hemisphere from France. And he did it illegally. He stole it from King Louis by seducing a noblewoman who had a weird illness that meant her doctor could get into the royal garden where the only plant in France was located. He stole a clipping of it, smuggled it out of France, got aboard a ship that got attacked by the Barbary pirates, got in a hurricane, and then ran out of wind in the doldrums. They ran out of food and water. So he was sharing his water ration with the plant every day. And that's what this, you know, etching is from in history. It's him, you know, sharing his uh, water with the little coffee plant. And uh, he gets back to Martinique in the Caribbean, in the French Caribbean, plants it there. And that's where coffee started in this hemisphere. It was not Brazil or Colombia or Guatemala. Uh, it was in the Caribbean in Martinique in 1723 uh, from Gabriel de Clouse. It's an adventure story. It's a fun read. It's, it's you know, historical fiction because I wrote it from his first person perspective. So it's in his voice. And I'd encourage folks to check it out. And then I got uh, most recently Cyberfire, which is an action thriller based loosely in the future, you know, a couple years out, you know, so it's kind of like uh, could happen. Um, and it's about a record heat wave that hits the Southwest, you know, 130, 140 degree heat. Um, and at the same time, uh, the, the cyber hackers have done to us what we did to the Iranian centrifuges. They've used kind of a Stuxnet style cyber attack to uh, eliminate our transformer stations uh, from operating. And for people that don't know, transformer stations provide all the power they distribute it to the grid. So even if your power plants are working fine without a transformer, you get no power. And they take about a year to replace, six months to a year. So if they go down in any kind of systematic way, uh, we're in deep trouble. And so that's the premise of the book. There's a couple different plot lines of people struggling to kind of make ends meet, you know, in the Southwest. And then the team of heroes trying to find the hackers and deactivate, you know, the uh, the virus. And um, it's a really good read. I hope everyone uh, finds out what happens at the end. Well, I went to Amazon and picked up Coffee Smugglers. And by the way, friends, if you're a Kindle reader, there's a $5 version. And frankly, that's what you would spend to buy a crappy cup of coffee at Starbucks. And so you should trade the bad coffee for the book. But I was curious, is your wife's Bolivian family tied in any way to the coffee profession? Because that's where my mind went when I knew yeah, you had yeah. the coffee book and your wife's Bolivian. Totally curious. Right. I, I would love this romantic vision of me, you know, sitting on the jungled mountainside in my coffee finca with the family. But uh, they're, they're city folk, more or less. They live in a city called Cochabamba. Um, but they now run the camping stores that we started when we were living down there. Um, so if anyone goes traveling through Bolivia, uh, check out the Spitting Llama Bookstore and Outfitter. That's our stores. And we, we work with tourists and locals, and it's a lot of fun. So her family are retired. They come up and visit us and their grandkids like once a year. You might have to do one, two, three in me because maybe you'll find out there is some DNA connection. And wouldn't that be wild and crazy because you just never know anymore. And by the way, that cyber fire book, have you heard of yeah. Nicholas Smith? Do you know him? No, I don't. So he wrote a book called Trackers, and I got connected to him because one of my clients is a retired colonel who was a resource for his books. But he talks about the possibility of EMP attacks. So I right. you talk about the attacks on the infrastructure. It's a different infrastructure suspense setup, but you should totally check out his book yeah. trackers because it sounds like y'all could be 
you know, nerdy friends. If uh, you oh, like his book, I could introduce you. <laughs> there's a great book called One Second After uh, about an EMP attack as well. I've read that one. That's good too. Yeah, that was research for this one. So you may hear some echoes. Uh, oh, so you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a, I'm a big book nerd. So I love being able to showcase new things to read. All right. So, Dave, if anybody wants to connect with you, whether it's about investment yeah. real estate or about how to find a wonderful Bolivian wife or how to write a book or what books they should read, how can they reach out to you and further connect with the son of Maine? Yes. If they, if they were, are interested in investing in one of my syndications or connecting with me for any kind of guidance, happy to chat. And they should just give me a call. 207-517-5700. They can hop on my website, which is holmanhomes.com. And my email is simple. It's just Dave at HolmanHomes.com. So I try to be available for folks and no one ever reaches out. So you might as well be be brave and, uh, you know, try it. So I have to tell you the funniest thing since you said nobody reaches out. So one of the books I'm reading right now is Dream Big by Bob Goff. And I love Bob Goff. In his book, he has his cell phone number in the, is it the afterword or the forward? Oh, no personal cell phone and he says in the book he's like my editor thought I was crazy to do that because yeah. my phone would ring off the hook and he said you know I maybe get x number of phone calls but it's actually right. not that many but he loves the ones that he gets and so y'all should reach out to Dave because anybody in the real estate space loves to talk and don't worry because all of his information is in the show notes for this episode so you can reach out at any time and he can probably tell you where to stay if you go up to Arcadia National Park. So Dave, thank you for coming on the show and for giving us a lot of different little insights and glimpses. And hopefully you'll hear from some really interesting people to make your life more interesting going into the next year. Thank you so much, Lee. I've enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. All right, guys, make sure you subscribe to the podcast and give five stars. That's kind of a rule around here. And always tune back in because you never know what we're going to be talking about over here on Crazy Shit in Real Estate. And I'll see you next time. If you are listening to this episode and you need to tell us something about your crazy life in or around real estate, then tweet me at Lee Brown or reach me on any of the social networks. That's if you're a broker, realtor, investor, inspector, lender, or just a regular normal human being who happens to have dealt in real estate. Subscribe for more episodes. And as always, we are thrilled that you joined us for some crazy shit in real estate. See you next time.